All right, so this is going to be a, a little overview of obtaining energy from coal mines in non-traditional ways. And the inspiration for this is something I, I, I was having a discussion with somebody recently about the anthracite region of Pennsylvania, which is northeastern Pennsylvania, and the fact that over the past several decades, going back probably to the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, there have been all these, there's been a couple different um, widely publicized concepts to revive the anthracite fields. And there are about four different technologies that somebody could lump into this idea. And I'm going to kind of describe all four of them. Uh, out of the four, only one has been sort of quasi-commercialized. Actually, I mean, it's commercialized, but it's, it's probably not something anybody would do unless they were incentivized to, um, through various means to do it. It wouldn't be something somebody just decided to go into business doing. So... Obviously, I'm talking about Pennsylvania, which is a major, always has been a major coal producer in the United States. But there's other states, West Virginia, Kentucky, Virginia um, are the big ones. And then, of course, Wyoming out west. Now, Wyoming and Montana, most of the coal is mined, probably all of it is mined, surface mining, using big strip mines or open pit mines that are a little bit different than the underground stuff we had here and still somewhat do have here in the East. Oh, Illinois is another big coal producer. So, the anthracite region probably saw its heyday in the 1910s. So, 100 years ago, effectively, in, the, in the, that early decade or two of the 20th century. And probably around the after the after the Great Depression, it went into a major decline for various reasons um, that are very relevant today to the coal industry. Uh, so you had the fact that oil and gas and other ener electricity and other energy sources were taking over the market for home heating. So anthracite's big claim to fame is that it is a very clean burning coal. It doesn't produce the same amount of soot and particulate matter and sulfur dioxide and other noxious uh, pollution that bituminous coal, which is far more common, that you would find with that. So people who like to use anthracite for heating their houses. So it was also used in industry to some extent for heating purposes in the eastern U.S., but people realized pretty early on, oh, wait a minute, it's easier, cheaper, cleaner, less maintenance, less hassle, less pain in the butt for me to just use electricity, oil, or gas to do the same job. I mean, most of us nowadays can't envision heating our homes with coal. It still happens. There's still people who do it. But most of them will tell you that it's significant labor involved compared with just turning a knob on the wall and writing a check out at the end of the month or paying a bill to a utility company. So the demise of the anthracite industry was an energy transition situation, just like we have nowadays with fossil fuels and renewable energy, just on a more localized scale. The other problem they had was the fact that these deposits, the easy to access stuff was being depleted and they started using um, deposits that were less desirable. So in 1959, we had the Knox Mine Disaster where the Susquehanna River broke through into the mines and flooded many of the mines. And that flooding of the mines with water is relevant to one of these technologies that I'm going to talk about here. So not to spend too much time on the history, but there's four technologies. Hopefully the lights here are not creating too much glare, but we'll try to write um, a list of all the ways you can obtain energy from coal mines other than the traditional going in and pulling the coal out and using it as fuel. So item number one, when we have a coal mine, so in the anthracite mines back in the old days, they would have coal breakers that would basically sort the coal according to quality and and, and size and things like that 
and there's a lot of rock and shale and slate and other materials, non-combustible matter, that gets mixed in with the coal during the mining process. Obviously, it's a natural substance, so it's going to have a lot of undesirable contaminants. So they would sort the coal and remove as much of the rock as possible. And what ended up happening is that process was not, especially in the old days, was not very effective um, compared with now. So they had a lot of what they called calm. Now, and this, this, this term is, is unique to the anthracite industry. In other types of coal fields, they'll call it things like job, GOB, um, spoil. It's just basically coal that is not does not meet quality control standards for the time and place. So they would take this stuff, they take the calm, that's the word I'm going to use because that's what I'm familiar with. They would take this and put it into giant piles and just store it, just, just stockpile it. Um, and next thing you know, we have uh, millions and millions and millions of tons of calm banks sitting in, all over the place. So, a comb bank is just a pile of this, this low-grade waste material from the coal sorting and you know, process. People didn't want to be burning lots of coal with a lot of mineral matter for their home heating. They didn't want to be dealing with all the ash that would be generated, so they tried to sort out as much of that as possible. But the problem is, a lot of coal came along, a lot of carbon, carbon came along for the ride during the sorting process. You had fine material that got through, you had coal mixed in with the rocks. A lot of these coal banks have a significant fraction of burnable carbon in them. But at the, back in the, in, the, in the day that it was generated, they didn't have a technology that could economically um, use that material as a fuel. People that were burning coal for heating, they didn't want this stuff. They didn't have equipment that was capable of properly combusting it. So we just st stashed it in big piles, right? And it accumulated and it, and it's, and it was an absolute eyesore um, for a long time and still is in many areas. So we could take that comb and we can actually today, using modern technology, we can actually burn off the carbon that's inside of it and use that carbon in the traditional sense to generate heat and electricity. So the key to making that technology work was what they call the fluidized bed combustor. So fluidized bed was a um, was a is a big basically a big vessel. Usually they're cylindrical and vertically cylindrical, and um, it had a vent at the top, and they would take this. Uh, fluidized bed and, and the bottom would have um, a, a screen of some kind on it with perforations and then there would be a blower, a powerful fan that would blow air in here and then sitting on top of this screen is a uh, bed of sand or fine refractory heat resistant material. Usually it was just like a, a silica sand or something like that that would take the heat, but it would also um, not melt and, and during, during combustion. So basically what they would do is they'd get this sand to the temperature of I would probably about 1600 or so Fahrenheit, and the fan is shooting air into the bottom of this. They call this the wind box at the bottom here. And it causes the sand to basically act like a fluid, act like liquid. So if you were to take a, a open a port up on the side of this furnace and look in here, you would see it looks like a bubbling volcanic lava almost. So this sand is churning around. And uh, the whole idea here is you take your comb, your rock with a little bit of carbon in it, and you send it into this system and it falls down into the bed of bubbling heated sand. And what that sand does is it, it, heat, it gives it heat transfer. So it's very hard to burn calm because it's mostly rock and mineral matter. But if you put it into this fluidized bed, it's kind of like putting it into a, into a molten 
solution into a very high temperature liquid and the heat transfers to it and the carbon then can react with the oxygen that's being supplied and it releases energy just like it would you know a normal fire does and then that carbon heats up and keeps this fluid ice bed hot but it also produces heat energy that then can be used to make steam so we get our heat transfer through the above the, the fluidized bed into a traditional you know a boiler with coils of, of you know boiler tubes we heat up water we make steam that then we can send off for power generation so this is the only one of the four technologies that's been commercialized for reclaiming abandoned mine energy energy from abandoned mine sites or old anthracite or old coal mines. These plants are known by several names. Sometimes pe some people call them cogeneration plants. Um, some people call them uh, waste coal power plants. Uh, whatever you call them, all it is is it's a plant that's able to, through its fluidized bed, it's able to combust the calm, the waste coal that has very low heating value. Um, some plants, probably not as much now, but some plants in the past would take the comb and they'd blend it with good coal, with higher quality coal, in order to burn it in a traditional power plant pulverized fuel burner. But when we think of comb combustion for power generation, we use think of the fluidized bed because that is the technology that's present at all these little so-called cogen plants. Um, the word cogen is confused, always been confusing to me because I hear cogeneration, I think of combined heat and power, which is a separate animal from this. These plants could do combined heat and power, but most of them don't. Most of them just generate electricity. So I think the whole idea of cogeneration came from the fact that this plant is not it is not built for the purpose of generating electricity. Nobody came along and said, well, I'm going to build one of these and generate power, and that's going to be my primary business. No, these, these plants came into existence to reclaim abandoned mine lands, and generating electricity is more or less a byproduct of their operation. But it's the thing that enables this to, to occur in an economical fashion, because if, you know, you had to build something like this that had no saleable product, somebody would be losing a lot of money. Somebody would be paying big bucks to run this system when there's nothing that can be sold to cover the costs. But they can generate electricity and they can cover most, of probably whatever amount, some percentage of their cost. Um, but in the state of Pennsylvania, waste coal is actually considered to be a tier two renewable resource, electricity supply resource. Uh, obviously it's not renewable in the traditional sense of the word, but it's classified as such so that it gets the benefits of renewable energy because this has the side product of reclaiming coal banks and taking this noxious material that has a lot of carbon and sulfur in it and converting it into an ash that's more or less inert. Uh, one of the other benefits of these fluidized beds is they'll put the comb in here, but they will also add uh, limestone. So limestone is calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate falls into this reactor, into this, into this furnace, and it basically reacts with the sulfur that's in the coal, that's in the comb. So at high temperatures, you're forming calcium sulfate, which is gypsum, and that stays in the ash. It stays down here. Um, it probably forms some other compounds because of the heat, but then that sulfur is then in the ash in a salt form, in, an in, in a naturally inert form that's not going to leach in the, uh, in the environment versus going up the stack as sulfur dioxide. So these plants don't have to use flue gas scrubbers to remove the sulfur from the uh, from the combustion because they can add the limestone right into the furnace and it will react 
in gas phase inside the um, gas to solid reaction inside the fluidized bed. So all the ash that comes out of this thing, they, I don't know how they do this. I don't know how they sort the ash out from the sand, but these plants have a means of separating the ash from the sand and then they can send the ash back out into the into the vine land and use it for reclamation. So that's fluidized bed. So this is the only system that's been commercialized. It's a lot of detail about it, but that's how it works. So now, what about the other three things that I brought up? Well, okay, so more speculative technologies. Let's see. Number two, number three, and number four. So number two, we're gonna talk about um, mine fire geothermal heating. All right, number three, flooded mine geothermal heating. Or mine pool. That's the term that I hear where people say all the time is the mine pool. Mine pool. So we got fire and we got water. And then the fourth item is what we call underground coal gasification or um, UCG. And these are kind of listed in no particular order. But what are we talking about with a mine fire geo, geothermal? Well, okay, so I'm using the term geothermal. We need to make sure that we're not talking about the traditional meaning of geothermal, which is extracting energy from the inner layers of the earth. So we're not talking about using volcanic heat. So there's no magma reservoirs within any reasonable distance of this location where these mining happened. Uh, most coal-bearing regions are not igneous rock, volcanic regions. And that makes sense geologically because coal is a very, very long-term sedimentary process that forms over um, an amount of time where millions and millions of years of buildup of sediments. And if you had this in a place where there was a lot of volcanic activity, those two things kind of clash with, with each other. You don't really have the same, them happening to that extent in the same location. We don't have volcanic activity around here. Um, so, mine fire geothermal, geothermal in quotes. Basically we have the mine fires, so right up the street up here there's the red ash Laurel Run mine fire that's been burning since 2000 or 1915, 107 years, right? So that fire was started by a, um, they believe it was a lamp, a lamp that was left in a, in a in a shaft, and the lamp ignited some timbers, and then the timbers ignited the coal bed. So obviously, you know it's. If anybody's watched any of the documentaries on Centralia, Pennsylvania, or any of the mine fire regions, it just sounds so apocalyptic. Oh my God, the earth it was on fire. Um, but in reality, these fires, these mine fires, they don't burn at a very high intensity. So Laurel Run, you know, it's been burning for 107 years, but the amount of coal that's actually been combusted isn't all that much. It's probably at most a few million tons. It's definitely not a very fast combustion. It's kind of like if you were to light a cigarette or a stick of incense and just sit it on the sit it down and just let it go. That's the kind of combustion that's going on in these mine fires. Very very slow. Um, the temperatures are not, from the, from the relative standpoint of combustion, they're not very high. Um, and the oxygen that's able to get down into there is not very much. 
So in order to extract energy from a mine fire, you have to somehow get heat transfer from the fire to the surface. You know, and the traditional way that you could think of doing that is injecting a fluid into the ground and then extracting the fluid somewhere else down, down gradient from that. Well, obviously, if you pump water down there, which water is the obvious choice because it's very good for heat transfer, if you pump water down there and you try to make steam, you're going to suck away the heat very, very fast. If you just put straight up liquid water down there, you're going to probably quench the fire and you're going to defeat the entire purpose of doing what you're doing. And the, the heat that you're going to be able to extract isn't going to be very high grade. Um, and the megawatts you're going to be able to get out of that is not very much. And then the water is going to be all contaminated with, assuming it's an open system, all kinds of dirt and material and acids and corrosive stuff that is not good for power generation equipment. So the other idea people have about mine fire geothermal is well we could just lay tubing in the ground and suck the heat off of that okay so then you know the same idea applies how many megawatts can you get per unit length of tubing or per acre of land um, the fact of the matter is these fires burn so slow that you would be better off just putting solar thermal uh, panels on that land rather than or solar photovoltaic panels on that land rather than trying to come up with some concoction to extract heat from the mine fire. So, mine fire, this, this was a um, concept that I think was talked about in the news, there were some newspaper articles on it because some local, um, probably politicians and others may have gotten this into their, uh, into their heads that, hey, this would be a good resource, but in reality, it's when you get into the energetics of it, it's not, it just does not work. It, it's like trying to suck heat out of a burning cigarette. You're just going to put out the fire and, um, and you're not going to get that many megawatts per unit area that you try to do this through. <clears throat> okay. Mine fire. So we aren't doing this for those reasons. How about the mine pool? All right, well, okay. How do you get heat? How do you get energy? From the pool. So what is the mine pool? Well, I said that the Knox mine disaster, the water from the river went down into the mines and flooded them all and basically ceased operation of all the pumping systems and everything. And now naturally those mines serve as a conducting uh, pathway for groundwater. So they're all filled with water. And being that they're pretty deep, the water stays at a relatively constant temperature throughout the year. Around here, it's like 52 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's basically your average annual temperature. So if you took all the days of the year and all the temperatures and average them together, it gets to about that level. And the reason that for that is because the ground is a very, very high thermal mass, especially if there's water in it. Water has a very high specific heat capacity compared with most materials. So if there's water there, that acts as a thermal mass to hold on to heat throughout the year. So the idea here is we have this enormous heat sink below us in the form of liquid water in the mine pool, the flooded mines. So if we were to take that water during the winter time and we were to suck, pull that water up out of the mine pool and put it through a heat pump, all right? The mine pool method is completely dependent upon using heat pumps. It's not a thermodynamic process like you have up here where we're trying to get high temperatures. All we're doing is we're using this 52 degree water or whatever it is at the time and we're either going to put heat into it for air conditioning or we're going to suck heat out of it for heating. We're going to use the heat pump to upgrade or downgrade the temperature depending upon what, what, what our goal is. So right now it's summertime, it's very warm outside, so we have uh, the air conditioning system is going to dump the heat into the 52 degree water in the mine pool. And that's very nice because traditionally an air conditioning system has to dump its heat into a higher temperature reservoir, which is the outside air. So if you want it to be 75 degrees in the house, 
but it's 90 outside, you have to run your heat pump or your AC compressor such that it pushes the heat towards the higher temperature outdoor air. But if we can do it, dump it into 52 degree water, that compressor has to work a lot less in order to get that heat across because the temperature difference is actually such that the house temperature or the building temperature is above that of the heat sink. So the heat, not only are you pushing it with a compressor, but it naturally wants to move towards the lower, higher temperature to lower temperature. So this is very, 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 very good way to do air conditioning. If you can dump the heat into the mine pool instead of the outside ambient environment, <clears throat> it'll save you on electricity to drive your heat pump or your, your compressor. The opposite side of that is, okay, so in the summertime, all summer long, you're dumping all this heat into the mine pool at 52 degrees. Well, this, that heat is going to actually increase the temperature of that mine pool. Now, being that it's such a large volume of water, you would need a lot of users dumping their heat into there to raise its temperature of any significance. But theoretically, the energy that you're putting into that, come wintertime, you can reverse your heat pump and now you can suck heat out of that water. So we pull the water out of the mine pool at 52 degrees. We send it through the evaporator of our heat pump. And then the water gets chilled down to, say, 38 degrees. We throw that 38 degree water back into the mine pool. And then we use the energy that was in the difference between 52 and 38 degrees, upgrade it with the compressor, send it into a condenser, heat pump condenser in the building and then heat the building with it. So this is actually a very viable, um, very much more viable idea than the mine fire is. But to my knowledge, nobody's using this in northeastern Pennsylvania, but theoretically this would, would work. There's nothing really saying it would. The, the challenge you have is just getting access to the mine pool water. You know, you'd have to use a well of some kind to get down there and tap into it. So the, uh, the, last, the last technology is actually an artificial variant of the mine fire version, but it's a little bit more controlled and, um, and engineered. But given the climate, pun intended, situation today, the, cl the energy climate, uh, both in terms of environmental issues with greenhouse gases and the economics of alternatives to fossil fuels, you're probably never going to see this happen. So what is underground coal gasification, UCG? So UCG is basically um, keeping the coal in the ground, but extracting it chemically and energetically through a sort of in situ combustion process. So we're gonna burn the coal, kind of semi burn the coal while it's still in the earth. So let's just say this is our surface of the earth right here, our ground level, our gradient, uh, ground um, level. And down here, under the ground, we've got a coal bed or coal seam, okay, that kind of just stretches. This is all coal. So it's, uh, you know, this is kind of how it formed. There's a layer of coal below grade, so we do some prospecting. We figure out where that is, how thick it is, how far out it goes. But instead of stripping off the top of the land in order to access this or tunneling down and then digging out and removing the coal seam, as we do in traditional mining, we're just gonna let it in place. And what we're gonna do is over here, we're gonna drill a well or a series of wells down into this, um, into this coal seam, all right? And then over here, we're gonna drill another set of wells. All right, so we're borrowing some ideas from the oil and gas industry, but coal, is a solid. So you drill a well into it, you're not going to get anything. Maybe some water, I don't know. You're not going to get any fuel out of it, that's for sure. But what they can do, um, obviously, you know, 
you might you might fracture this just like we fracture rock for oil and gas production but either way you're going to get a, a conductance of gas between these two wells you're going to make sure that you can get gas to flow from here to here okay you want to get gases to go down and you want gases to come up and what we're going to do is over here we're going to set up an oxygen generator. We're gonna take air, we're gonna concentrate the oxygen that's in the air, and we're gonna send that oxygen down, down the well, right? Oxygen is gonna be pumped down here, and then we are going to, at the bottom of this hole, we will have an ignition device. And we will light the coal on fire in the ground. So basically we're gonna put pressurized oxygen, this is gonna be under pressure with a compressor, force it down the hole, start a combustion front down inside this uh, coal seam, and that coal is now going to start burning here. Now we are gonna control the flow of oxygen such that we start to release heat and we start to gasify the coal uh, at some point, we are going to take our oxygen generator and we're going to supplement the oxygen with steam. All right, so we're going to put oxygen and steam, uh, water basically, down the hole. And then what you'll have happen is the steam will react with the, um, actually, uh, probably a couple of different chemical reactions will happen here. So carbon plus oxygen, assuming that we limit the flow rate of oxygen, we're going to create carbon monoxide. And then we're gonna take our carbon monoxide and we're gonna react that with steam, with water. We're gonna form uh, hydrogen and probably some CO2. And uh, coming up out of this well over here, we're gonna get a mixture of CO, H2, uh, probably some CO2, and maybe some methane, I don't know, depending upon the conditions of how they're running it. Basically, we're gonna control the injection of these gases, these oxidizing gases, and we're gonna get this mixture coming out on the other side. And all of the carbon that is in this, all the volatile elements that are in this coal seam will eventually be consumed as this was as if this was a burning piece of incense. And you lit the incense over here and it burned all the way down to the end. And then when we hit the end, our coal seam is completely consumed and we've mined all of the material out of it. Now this mixture here can then be sent off and used for power generation because these gases, with the exception of this one, are all combustible. We could use the hydrogen and carbon monoxide and methane as a fuel. So that's underground coal gasification. Has this ever been done? I don't know. It probably has been done experimentally, but to my knowledge, it's not commercially done. I mean, if this was easy, why would anybody be mining coal in the old fashioned way? Like if you could convert the coal into a gas and send it through a pipeline, everybody would be doing it. But it's clear that not everybody's doing it. And there's still mining coal, the old school strip mines and underground mines. So even though this is a theoretical idea and this has been brought up in various conversations I've had about the, the, mine, the coal region, this has, not only is it probably not technically feasible, economically feasible, it surely is not compatible with the current idea of limiting greenhouse gas emissions because when you burn this mixture, you're gonna get CO2 just, as if, just like you would if you had mined the coal out of the ground in solid form and burned it in solid form. Um, and, and the other thing with this is because we have to provide oxidizing gas. We're using extra energy to drive the oxygen generators. So there's a parasitic component that's not there 
that you that you would would not have if you were just burning the coal as a solid fuel. So the this is definitely not something that um, that I envision ever happening. The costs are just too excessive. The complexity. Not only are you getting these gases, but all the sulfur and nitrogen and chlorine and all the other stuff that's in here is going to come up here. You're going to have all sorts of nasty stuff because this conditions, the conditions are going to be kept such that you're not fully oxidizing contamination. So all the sulfur, well, you'll get a lot of sulfur coming out as hydrogen sulfide. You'll probably get a lot of HCl. You'll probably get some hydrogen cyanide from the nitrogen content of the coal. All these gases, mercury, all this stuff is going to contaminate your product and you're going to have to remove it. The same as it would in a traditional coal gasification plant. And those plants are, everybody's waxed poetic over them for the past, I can remember 2000, the, the late 2000s, the last big energy craze. Everybody's talking about coal integrated gasification, combined cycle power plants and how we're going to have all these we're going to use all this coal and not use imported fuel it never happened and let's just probably be happy that it never happened because we'd be stuck with all those stranded assets that create greenhouse gases and that are probably more expensive than just using renewable energy so coal gasification you're not going to see it so the uh, like i said we had one technology that was commercialized that was the cogen or the fluidized bed combustion of calm or coal waste happening right now there's many probably a dozen plants throughout the the coal region between west virginia and pennsylvania that are burning the coal waste and then you've got the mine pool which is probably a unique to northeast pa probably a unique to the wyoming valley phenomenon but that's where you're just using the groundwater as a heat pump, as a heat source and a heat sink. Um, it's the same exact idea as the so-called geothermal heating for houses, where they'll either pull water out of a well or they'll pump water through tubing in the ground and then use a heat pump to either take heat out of that groundwater or put heat into the groundwater. It's not actually burning any fuel. The only energy you're using Externally, it's just electricity to drive the heat pump. And obviously with electricity, you can get the electricity from any energy source. It doesn't have to be fossil fuels. So that's it. Coal, mine, reclamation, energy technologies. So the four options that are there and the ones that we either use or could use in a um, feasible manner.